Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, The Evolution of Strategic Esourcing, from Savings-Focused to Supplier-Centric. I would now like to introduce Konstantin Limbarakis, Director of Product Marketing at Selectica. Konstantin? Hi, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, depending upon where you're joining us today. Uh, we're really excited about presenting this topic uh, today as, as, a, as a part of our ongoing webinars that we present uh, to the community. What I'd like to first do is talk just briefly here about our agenda. We're just going to do a, a quick introduction about Selectica, uh, talk, do an introduction on some of our presenters that are presenting today, and then deep dive into a little bit of some research that uh, our, our panelist and, and guest, uh, Andrew Bartolini from Arted Partners, has created uh, as a part of the research that they do. Then we'll talk a little bit about addressing some of the modern sourcing needs as a technology and understand some of the changes and the evolution that we've seen as a provider uh, here at Selectica, and then have uh, a discussion, too, on some of the competitive edge aspects that we see with e-sourcing, particularly with a, a, the aspect of supplier management and contracts from one of our uh, solution engineers and colleagues here at Selectica and what we see in the field. And then we'll follow this up with a, a Q&A uh, that we'd like to open up to uh, everybody for questions and, and answer session at the end of the webinar. With that, I'd like to talk just briefly here about uh, Selectica. For those of you that have been following the organization over the past several years, um, you've seen that we've gone through quite a few changes as a company. And what we can see is there's a combination of the DNA of some leading technology providers that have happened over the past uh, couple of years in particular. As you can see, at Selectica, an organization that was focused in CLM, has gone through an evolution working with uh, its, itself as a CLM provider, and then acquiring IASTA last year as a, as a leader in the supply management, e-sourcing supply, supplier management space. And then our most recent acquisition has been with BPAC, a recognized provider of the procure to pay uh, in, the rec in the procure to pay area. Each of us in those different respective organizations have our own unique DNA that we brought something unique to the table. And today we're creating a new DNA of the company that is providing some unique aspects of what it means to be an organization. So as a organization today, by combining the strengths of these unique uh, companies that have their own unique histories, we're creating uh, an innovative culture that's client and satisfaction co focused with three leading solutions that are being unified. And then now we're able to tap into untapped synergies that will create us as a market leader in the space going forward. As we see by the unification of bringing together uh, these three organizations that in their own right were, were very powerful and very recognized, uh, we've created an environment or an ecosystem that now looks at the, the big picture of an enterprise-led contract management with supply management. And our solutions by bringing together these three unique ecosystems into one, uh, one framework provides insight, vision, insight, and control where it's necessary to uh, mitigate cost or mitigate risk, control cost, and drive revenue. As a part of our discussion today, we are particularly going to focus on the strategic sourcing side of, of the elements. And what that means is looking at areas of sourcing, spend analytics, understanding supplier management and supplier risk and compliance and all the components that we're seeing that is driving the definition of strategic sourcing and strategic sourcing applications today. As a result of that, what we're again we're doing is providing as thought leaders in the space through our solutions the ability for our customers to uh, provide a, a unique vision and insight and control into their enterprises and empowering our clients to use these insights to proactively again mitigate risk, control costs, and drive revenue. As a part of our, our wider discussion and in, in, in sharing what we do in the space, we like to do these webinars on a, on a certain recurrence. And we find that bringing in, inviting in some uh, unique people and, and specialists in the field help us convey this message as to what we're doing and how we're doing that. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker comes to us from Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, Andrew Bartolini is the Chief Research Officer uh, at Arden Partners who is the one that also started CPO Rising as part of that, and a colleague that I've known for quite some time in the space. Uh, so I'd like to introduce you, Andrew. Andrew, how are you doing today? 
Doing great, doing great. Get, uh, just gearing up to uh, start talking in a minute. Excellent, excellent. I hear there was a heat wave in Boston. Uh, do you guys have that today, or is it in the 90s? Uh, you know, today is actually the first day that it cooled off, but, uh, you know, don't worry about us. Fall, uh, uh, winter will be here soon enough with a, with a lot of snow. All right. Hopefully it won't be as bad as last year. Um, joining us here from the heartland of, of the U.S., I, I also have my colleague here, Josh Diles, who's a solution engineer here at Selecta, who has a lot of experience from the client-facing perspective of a lot of the needs and the challenges that our prospects and our customers are facing as it relates to strategic sourcing. So, Josh, welcome here on the webinar today. Thank you. Happy to be here. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, uh, thank you for being here and for joining us on this webinar. And, of course, my name is Konstantin Limbarakis. I'm a director of product marketing here at Selectica, and we'll be uh, talking a little bit about also uh, what we're doing here at Selectica as part of this uh, wider framework. So, without further ado, we have some interesting stuff to share with you folks today. So this idea around um, strategic sourcing, this evolution of strategic sourcing applications, what has happened and how are we uh, looking to, to uh, make those changes. What we want to do, first of all, is to look at some of the research that's out there that's pointing us to why we think there's changes, what, what's driving this evolution of, as, again, part of the theme of our webinar, which is going from savings focused to supplier-centric strategic sourcing. And I'd like to uh, turn it over now to Andrew to present some of the research that he's been doing here, uh, and particularly on this subject on strategic sourcing. So, Andrew, I'm handing it over to you. Great. Thanks, Constantine. Uh, hello and good day to everyone listening. Um, you know, so it, it's been for more than a decade now that I've been tracking and examining the strategic sourcing industry through market research studies that have been drawn from thousands and thousands of sourcing professionals. Now today, for the first time ever, I'm presenting the findings of my upcoming report that will publish at the end of the month. Uh, and is sponsored by Selectica. So for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to walk you through at a high level some of those key findings, right? And I'm going to do that in a pretty quick agenda here. We're going to talk about the state of strategic sourcing and the, and the four pillars of, of sourcing. Uh, we're going to drill down a little bit into best-in-class supplier management, and then we're going to end with some recommendations before, before passing it back over to the Selectica team. All right, so... You know, it really is, from my perspective, a great time to be working in procurement and, and in sourcing more specifically, right? The, the profession has established itself in most industries with a clearly defined value proposition. It has a standard approach to engagement, and it has a playbook of best practices. The resources available to chief procurement officers in 2015 and the tools they can employ are more robust and more accessible than they've ever been. You know, it's true that many procurement departments still struggle to accomplish basic things. And there are still enterprises where the concept of a strategic procurement operation has never been considered. But the leading practitioners in 2015 are driving their organizations along a maturity continuum that has begun to resemble many of the other, quote unquote, leading business functions within the enterprise. In 2015, procurement and sourcing leaders are still focused on savings, delivering value, and automating and linking their processes. But they're also focused on new innovation, collaboration, visibility and agility initiatives as they continue to prepare themselves and their teams for the next phase of procurement's evolution. The state of strategic sourcing in 2015 is strong. Now, before we get to those findings, I just want to talk very briefly about our approach. Right, so uh, I've been working in this industry for 16 plus years, have, have, have done a, a large amount of strategic sourcing myself as a consultant, uh, but I've also as a research analyst. Uh, personally overseen more than 120 unique research market studies uh, over the past decade. And as a result, I think that, that, that we at Arden Partners bring a very rigorous approach to our research as described here. Um, as part of these research efforts, I personally in, interviewed many uh, CPOs and sourcing leaders to add more context to the data and the analysis. Um, demographically, right, this study draws from more than 330 verified respondents. Um, and, and while this group does draw from all regions, uh, it does favor large enterprises based here in North America as well as in Europe. So with that, let's talk a little bit about uh, what sourcing organizations are facing in 2015. All right, so the pressure on procurement teams to deliver savings still persists as, at the top of all business pressures. But you know, I, I think it's important to note, right, we're talking about the evolution and the move away from savings-based sourcing 
to something that's more supplier centric, this number has dropped dramatically over the past seven or eight years. Uh, it used to be a number that uh, had been prior to, had been a top pressure of between 80 and 90 percent of all organizations. So this number has dropped uh, quite significantly. The gap. I think, as, as you see here, or as I'm describing, is, is much lower between savings and all other factors. Um, you know, I think that there's pressure, as we see here, from about a quarter of organizations to focus on their overall effectiveness and influence, and communication and collaboration continue to be important business pressures as well. Now, as part of looking at uh, savings pressure, I thought it would be interesting uh, to compare what are the different strategies for those organizations that are feeling an intense savings pressure and those that are not, and to compare and contrast to see um, if the different groups are, you know, taking different approaches and if they're uh, if they um, if they're executing different strategies in 2015. And 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 what I'm showing you here are the 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 strategies that have the largest differences on a percentage basis between the two groups. And and, and what we see, or, or sort of a quick takeaway, would be that the procurement teams that are less focused on savings in the short term have actually prioritized technology optimization and improving their staffs, while the group that's more focused on savings looks to suppliers as well as sourcing and cash management to achieve their goals. Um, you know, again, when we look out over uh, a medium term range, right, um, savings still tops the list, but again, just by a hair, you know, over the past decade, and, and, and granted some of this is linked to the business cycle and, and the amount of active sourcing and uh, that, that we've seen over the past uh, seven or eight years, but you know the gap between uh, savings and and these other priorities really has shrunk. Um, it honestly used to be savings and, and then everything else, uh, but today uh, procurement organizations and sourcing teams have have, have prioritized almost as much uh, on improving their processes and 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 two that have really. Uh, come from from nowhere over the past two years and gotten onto this chart, right? So this is a study that I've done annually for the past decade. Um, compliance and innovation have really started to rise as you start to look at organiz as organizations start to take uh, a mid-range view. Now, you know this is I think a, a, a very telling chart, right? I think certainly most CPOs view their department's work on a performance continuum, and um, you know procurement transformations that are that that are that are commenced are typically multi-year journeys, right, with some clearly defined milestones. Um, and I'd say generally no final destination, right? I mean, continuous improvement, after all, has become a standard business practice. But but that said, when when the question was posed to CPOs and, and, and leaders of procurement organizations and sourcing teams, nine out of ten saw room for immediate improvement. Uh, and again, the question was, you know, should you be doing better with the resources that you have in place today? Uh, and and so. You know, I think this is telling. Uh, it, it says that you know we've we've come a very long way over the past ten or fifteen years as a as an industry and as professionals, but there's still a lot of work to be done, right? What worked uh, in the past is no longer going to be good enough in 2015, uh, and even less so in the future. Now, I think this is actually one of the you know this is a newer slide, uh, a newer question, um, and and a newer data point, and, and and I think one of the most interesting findings in this year's report. And that is that when it comes to top strategies to help procurement ascend to the next level of performance, CPOs believe that being there earlier in, in, in the engagement on sourcing opportunities is the single largest opportunity, right? And, and that, that's great news, right, for, for everyone who's listening in today that comes from the sourcing part of their operation, right? Getting involved sooner on a sourcing project can make the difference between acting as an active project leader or as a simple order taker. Right. Our research has confirmed this view in the past, and it has shown that getting the sourcing team involved earlier on a project can also drive savings. It can improve quality and reduce risk. Right. Consider the impact that a simple redirection to a lower cost component or to a current preferred vendor can have during the design phase of a new product's development. Right. The ability to capture and use innovative ideas and other value added input from suppliers is far more likely to occur when the sourcing runway is long and project requirements, goals, and objectives can be shared and discussed in an iterative manner with leading suppliers. Right. So you know, what this says is that sourcing is still front and center and it is still the primary lever for procurement organizations to take a you know a step level improvement in their operations. Now, you know, 
since we're giving a very high level uh, review of the report, there's no great segue, but I wanted to, uh, no great segue to this slide, but I wanted to share with you some of the key benchmarks that we discovered in this study, right? And so first and foremost, spend under management, right? So a decade ago when I was an analyst, I spent a lot of time defining what spend under management was, and, 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 and so I, I will still define it here, um, but the, the point I would make is that many organizations weren't focused on it, didn't understand the importance of this metric uh, as it relates to the influence and potential impact that a procurement organization can have on the overall enterprise, on operations and on results, right? And so what we see today is that just a little bit more than 60% of total spend on is the average amount that a procurement organization has under their management, right? And so the spend that we're talking about is the direct spend, it's the indirect spend, and it's the services spend. Uh, and for some organizations, they would include capital spend as well. Um, procurement managing 60% today means they're not managing 40% and has a huge opportunity. When we look at the savings numbers, you know, we've seen a, a, a steady trend down. Um, you know, this is in part to do to the fact that the, the sourcing waters were heavily fished uh, during and, and, and immediately after uh, the global recession, 2008, 2009, 2010 timeframes, um, and also uh, speaks to to a somewhat inflationary environment in some commodities um, you know, over the past couple of years. Um, certainly there are a few like oil that, that are going that opposite way. Uh, what's interesting here though is that um, you know, a, a key factor, a key element for sourcing organizations, and, and, and these would all be metrics that we think are very important for your organizations to track, is that the addressable spend that's sourced by the average organization is approaching 50%. So this means that, that sourcing really has become de rigueur, right? It is standard operating practice for most organizations. And, and I think that that's very exciting because, you know, not too long ago that wasn't, that wasn't the case at most organizations. Now, I wanted to just share with you a few supplier metrics, um, you know, that we think are also important to track and understand. Uh, the first is, is the, the Pareto analysis of your supply base, the Pareto analysis of your spend. Um, and, and really looks to see, well, what's the, you know, how, what percentage of your total suppliers comprise 80% of your spend? And that number, uh, you know, is close to Pareto at, at, at almost 22%. Um, now, enabled suppliers is a metric here that looks at, um, you know, are, what percentage of your suppliers are able to receive uh, purchase orders and, and uh, you know, you know, do invoicing electronically, uh, how, what percentage of your suppliers are enabled on your technology platforms and to communicate and collaborate electronically. And that number continues, you know, steadily grows each year, just, you know, little by little. Um, the last number here, and, and, and in the context of, of this research study, uh, because it's not industry specific and because it's very broad based, I don't know that this is a, a benchmark that you should you know, I, th I think it's a, a, a number that you need to understand, but you have to understand uh, the percentage of your high-risk suppliers in the context of your own business. And, and so just, you know, think it's interesting and just something to put out there that, uh, you know, industry-wide, 6.5% uh, of, of all suppliers are viewed as high-risk. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about best-in-class supply management, right? So one of the major themes of this year's report is the idea that best-in-class sourcing requires a variety of capabilities across staff, across systems, and operations. Uh, but before I start to talk a little bit about that, I want to want to start with our definition of strategic sourcing. All right, so this is a definition that has evolved over the the past 15 years as, as I've been working in this industry. Uh, and this, you know, again, it's our definition and our definition of that has evolved. And, and it really is, I think, our hope that this becomes, you know, a standard, a standard way that organizations are thinking about um, their strategic sourcing, right? I mean, clearly, you know, sourcing, you know, means going out and, 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 and finding the, you know, the best available, the highest valued suppliers. Uh, but there's a couple of things that, that we've added in recently to the definition and I, that I just want to call out, right? So, um, you know, the first is that I think to, to be strategic, sourcing in 2015 has to use technology, e-sourcing, um, and, and where possible other supply management technology like spend analysis, contract management, and, and, and the related tools around supplier management. Um, you know, the use of e-sourcing doesn't change your strategy, it enhances it. And I really do feel that a sourcing process that intentionally bypasses process automation can no longer be considered truly a tr truly strategic process in 2015. 
Uh, the other point that I would make with strategic sourcing is that the terms strategic sourcing and sourcing are converging to mean basically the same thing. Right? Uh, strategic sourcing in 2015 you know, can no longer just be this static methodology. You've got to check every single box along the process uh, matrix that you have. Um, and it doesn't necessarily refer only to large, multifunctional, you know, cross-enterprise or enterprise-wide projects, right? Teams have to learn to take a more nuanced and agile approach to every sourcing opportunity. And it's really considering all of the sourcing activity as part of one larger program, a nuanced program, an agile program, um, we think is, is very important. So we start there with the strategic sourcing definition, and then more visually, right, when when we try to visualize, you know, that definition, you know, what are the, the components, right? What are, you know, in, in, in this research study's vernacular, the four pillars of strategic sourcing, right? So, you know, first, procurement departments that succeed in sourcing, you know, you know really drive consistent execution of, of, of their projects are the ones that take a holistic approach to this entire sourcing process. And they're also the ones that leverage process automation tools across it. Leading departments define their sourcing process as the one that begins with opportunity identification and carries through contract execution and supplier management. And you know, these are groups that seek to standardize their sourcing policies and processes at the enterprise level. Right? So you know, the four pillars, right? So spend analysis, right? Understanding uh, what your spend is, with whom, um, you know, and all of the detail related there. Uh, e-sourcing, right? You know, I think that is, as we just talked about in the definition of strategic sourcing, right? The use of technology, uh, you know, vitally important. Contracts, right? Closing the loop, right? Making ins ensuring that all of the work that you've done in in the sourcing process to get to that point is captured, all of that value. And then supplier management, and that's the area I'm going to focus on right now, right? So supplier management has several different components in, in our view, and I'm going to just sort of walk you through a few of those and, and then look at what the best in class are doing in these areas. Right, so first, supplier information management, right? The management of your supplier's information, uh, you know, becomes a critical part of the relationship management, right? So, I, you know, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about the, the complexity and speed of business, but, but, but the results of what's happening in the marketplace today is that organizations are more closely tied to their strategic suppliers, and, and that's those suppliers' performance and operations than they've ever been. Um, you know, the other part of it is that there's a requirement that you have to be lean and agile in the management of the relationships, right? Managing your suppliers uh, has a real cost, uh, but, but overlooking and, and mismanaging um, your suppliers and, and their information has an even larger cost, right? Consider the example on getting engaged earlier in sourcing that I used a few minutes ago, right? If you have good understanding of what your suppliers are delivering to you today, but then also their other capabilities, what are the other categories that these suppliers can deliver to you? Uh, you may not need to go out and you know go through an entire RFP process. Maybe you want to, but maybe it makes sense to start working with a supplier that you've already approved. That you know you've already you know gone through the entire uh, approval process of, of 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 vetting and onboarding them and, and ensuring that their um, you know their their processes are. Uh, up to the standards that are required. Um, so supplier information management, right? Very important part of this, right? I think everyone understands that managing suppliers' performance and tracking suppliers' performance is also critical uh, to driving to, to to driving value and ensuring that the value that you negotiated is being delivered by your suppliers, right? It really does matter, um, you know, how your suppliers are performing, and that it really does matter that the organizations understand when suppliers are performing well and can be rewarded, uh, understands when suppliers are, are not performing, and, you know, then that can be communicated to, and then you can course correct and take the appropriate action. Um, you know, as it relates, you know, if, if supplier information management is important and, and supplier performance management is really important, supply risk management is highly important, right? Um, and gaining visibility into your different suppliers' operations and having having a you know a grade system or you know a way to actively measure and track. Uh, you know, and identify really the, the relative risk that, that your different suppliers, uh, you know, have allows you to make much more informed decisions on where you apply resources, how you engage with suppliers, and work with them to uh, minimize or eliminate risk where possible. But, but, but above all, right, I think supplier risk management, you know, the importance is identifying it so that you understand what risks are being taken and, and then act accordingly. Now, 
going to move pretty quickly here to talk about the best in class and, and at a high level uh, for this research study. Uh, you know, we looked at two metrics to, to determine the, the best in class performance. And, and for Arden's definition of best in class, we look at the top 20% of performers and then really uh, across these two metrics and then, you know, what we see is the results and the comparison of the top 20% of performers versus all others, the other 80%. And what we see here, right, you know, really up and down the key metrics, uh, we do see that, that the best in class have outperformed, right? They're managing significantly more spend. They're driving considerably more savings, right? This is one of the largest gaps in an overall percentage that we've ever seen from a study, right? You know, we're at a time and place where, um, you know, the, the discerning organizations are saving more. Uh, the organizations that um, you know, again, are also sourcing significantly more, right? We haven't seen gaps like this in, in, in a decade's worth of studies. So, um, you know, the, the vast majority of the marketplace still has huge opportunities for improvement and that where we are in the marketplace, at least in this research study, uh, you know, the, the overall uh, industry benchmarks are being driven by this top performing group. I just want to look real quick at some of the strategies that the best-in-class are uh, employing to to really, you know, gain those advantages as we've seen across all those metrics, um, right? So, you know, by and large, you know, I sort of uh, just a few slides ago talked about, you know, what the leading sourcing organizations do and what they focus on, right? You know, automation, uh, ensuring that, it, you know, when they do have technology in place that they have programs to, to drive adoption. Uh, and then, you know, more of a supplier-centric focus. Again, you know, by and large, when you look at these numbers, um, huge opportunities overall for everyone to improve, including the best in class. Um, one more slide here, right? So when you look at supplier management capabilities, right, you, you see the spreads are a varying degree, but, you know, when you look at, you know, those organizations that rate themselves as having good and strong collaboration with their suppliers, right, nearly 60% of the best in class. Uh, but also I think a good mark is that nearly 50% of, of, of that other group. Um, you look at risk management programs and, and the best in class have, have, are more focused there. When you look at uh, supplier performance programs, uh, the best in class are also more focused there. Um, and so, you know, what we see is that, that, you know, if you were to sort of sum up, you know, very briefly from a supplier management or supply management view, um, you know, best in class are focused on the automation, getting the tools in place, getting the processes right. Uh, they're also more focused on establishing better relationships and better understandings with their suppliers. And, and all that makes sense, and all of that translates into the significantly higher results that I just showed you. So I'm going to give you a few recommendations, and then I'm going to pass it back over to, uh, to Josh and Constantine. Right? So you know, a few of the recommendations, and, and again, we'll recommend that for those of you that, that found today's uh, presentation, or my part of it, anyway, interesting that, that the State of Strategic Sourcing 2015 report will soon be available, available for my ASTA, and, and we'll also be distributing that from our CPO Rising and Arden Partners websites. But um, you know, if we're going to start, all right, let's look at the at the at the area that two thirds of all CPOs have identified as the top driver of getting their organizations to the next level of performance, and that's the game-changing strategy of getting engaged sooner in the sourcing process. Right, you have to find a way to do that. Uh, there's a variety of strategies and, and, and ways to do that within, within this, but making that a uh, priority for now and going forward into 2016. Um, you know, we looked at the four pillars and, and, and talking about each of those, right? Uh, standardize and automate spend visibility, right? Spend visibility is the foundation upon which best-in-class sourcing is built. Um, you know, we clearly have talked about the need to, to leverage e-sourcing, Right for strategic sourcing, right? You can't have you can't be strategic without leveraging technology and tools that are that are easily usable and easily deployed. Um, but ensure that the hard work in sourcing pays off by closing the process loop with standardized and automated contract management. Um, you know, maybe a, a newer idea and, and and again only touched upon very briefly, but. I'd like organizations to, to, to really begin to understand that supplier management is a vital part of the strategic sourcing process. Um, and then finally, um, you know, connect the dots, right? Each of the four pillars that we showed you on, the, on the, the chart with the chevrons, the visual chart, are important in and of themselves. But the results, when they're all brought together in a unified and holistic fashion, can be extraordinary. And so with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Josh and Constantine, and I will be sticking around to take your questions. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew, so much for that, uh, you know, a lot of deep dive into some of the, the, the quantitative aspects of your research and what you find. And 
you know, it is certainly amazing to see that, you know, strategic sourcing and sourcing applications in particular have been around for quite some time, yet we see sometimes then the deltas of what occurs and, you know, what is differentiating the best in class from their peers and what's causing that difference, particularly for those organizations that may have already adopted e-sourcing, say, back in the 2000s when e-sourcing was still something that was considered you know, quite revolutionary in running RFX and auctions. And so as part of the discussion, what we really wanted to do is talk about addressing modern sourcing needs from the strategic sourcing application suite. So one thing that we see here is, is you know, what's driving this change? If we look back at Andrew's data, we could see a lot of you know, flux and numbers that we're trying to understand, you know, what's causing a change in the direction of going from, you know, saving centric to supplier centric. And, you know, here at Selectica, we kind of have some kind of ideas of what we've seen and kind of what we've gotten feedback from in the market. And one of those key areas is really the ability to drive bottom line results based on value. So again, continuing to look at those savings where a majority of the CPOs and those in the procurement organization are still driving against that, but they're trying to understand spend behaviors through better tools that provide better analytics and decision support, but also lead the organization through total cost of ownership efforts. And, and those are a lot and often based on supplier selection decisions that aren't always based on a cost premise. The other idea that we've seen increased quite a bit is this notion around improved compliance. This is compliance with suppliers, not only against compliance on contracts of what we're buying, uh, you know, spend against a contract that we've agreed to, but also seeing this in the process of the onboarding. And this is something that Josh is going to get into quite later on about the idea of when I onboard a supplier, what are the certificates, what are the documents that I need to make sure I have that makes me compliant with my industry or compliant with our regulations, say, in the, in the food and beverage industry, or if I'm dealing with insurance or other areas that have, you know, a high cost associated if you don't vet that supplier properly and work with them uh, and find out that there's problems later on. Also, we're seeing this, this connection to the utilization of CLM with the bigger process. So contract lifecycle management being a core part of enforcing corporate policies and the ability to understand contractual relationships that were agreed upon in the early stages of, of the strategic sourcing uh, event that, that may have occurred and why we're working with that supplier. And then finally, the ability to collaborate with suppliers and reducing risk. You know, we're here all, all, all over the place with leading Fortune 500 companies or, or, you know, leading global organizations where they're seeing risks occurring because suppliers are failing on them where they may not have provided the right information or there's, there's issues related to FCPA, foreign corrupt practices, or there's issues related to content with conflict minerals, and, and those are regulations that need to be abided by for those particular organizations. So creating positive supplier relationships with technology and, and process are improving the ability to recognize these savings that, as Andrew was talking about, may have been beaten up over the course of the years when you were just looking at cost as a factor, and then being able to drive insights with, insights with a complete focus on having holistic supplier information and the ability to manage performance against that. Now, one of the things that we found, uh, and, and, and I went to an, uh, an, a conference last year at IACCM, um, which focused on contract management, and one of the, uh, the, the panelists there, this gentleman by the name of John Henke, provided some research on showing why supplier relationships matter more than ever today. And what he did is he took a look at the auto industry. Now this being a direct, uh, you know, direct supply chain, it, it talks about you know, a, a very succinct supply chain or supply management aspect. But what he found is that the, the better relations occur with suppliers that had uh, a positive relationship. So in other words, there is a causal relationship between supplier relations and corporate profit. And the way he was measuring this was by looking at a, relate, a working relationship index that showed that suppliers could have some significant impact on profits. And basically his, his, consent, his, his conclusion is, is that suppliers contribute to a firm's profit by giving the, pri the, the firm price concessions and by providing non-price benefits that improve the overall operational effectiveness and efficiency. So if we're seeing that these factors of this relationship have a positive relationship 
having a better insight into the entire strategic sourcing process and in being able to impact those relationships could have a huge impact on cost. So now turning back then to the idea around applications, where have we seen this kind of change and, and impact failing with traditional approaches in just looking at, say, e-sourcing on its own with RFX and auctions alone? And one thing that we've seen is that analytics sourcing and supplier management have traditionally been managed by point solutions. And so what we mean by that is, is that I bought a sourcing solution and I bought a supplier management solution where I have an analytics or a BI tool with IT that I have to plug into to understand what my spend is. And by not having those approaches unified, it prevents uh, the tendency or the ability to get a holistic view and pro procurement then tends towards different prop platforms to solve the chief challenge of the day, but they're not getting the, the big picture. The other thing that we saw is as a result of these gaps, procurement has, has tried to improve their ability to get visibility in this increasingly uh, high risks uh, culture or aspect of managing suppliers. But what's prevented them from getting this better visibility is having a common definition preference towards suppliers across the sourcing, the contracting, and operational processes. So when you onboard a supplier and you have supplier profiles, you have a continuous aspect to knowing who that supplier is throughout the process, even into the downstream, into the procure-to-pay aspect. The other challenge has been that you haven't had a true enterprise source of truth of that supplier, so you're not necessarily sure if the information on that supplier is up to date. Do we have all the proper certificates? Do we know that this supplier is compliant? Do we even have the right NDAs in place for that supplier to even do business with them? And as a result of that, you're not having a common source of truth. And oftentimes that, that might be because you may have a supplier management tool as a part of your ERP or have a separate vendor management system that's not working closely with what you're doing in sourcing or procurement. And then finally, as a result of that, you have suboptimal supplier selection criteria. You may not have all the information you need to correct to select the right supplier. And then you create uninformed decisions that continues this kind of status quo process when you really know that this process could be improved by having a more a better source of truth around your suppliers. Now, with that being said, one of the other things that we've seen is not only do we have these disjointed systems, but we're seeing this increase in pressure with the millennials out there. Now, we hear a lot about millennials in the context of business to consumer, and we hear a lot about how they're changing the framework with how technology is being developed, but anything from gaming to you know, how we're using and buying things online with our smartphones and smart devices. But what's very interesting is, is that we have to take a look at the fact that in the next five to 10 years, 75% of the workforce will be comprised of millennials, a group that has literally grown up with email, instant message, apps, text messages, and the internet. And so what this tells us is that how are those applications, those sourcing applications or supplier management or analytics applications that are out there that may have been implemented for the past decade, how are those then going to be able to cope and coincide with the needs of a newer workforce that is happening both on the buyer and on the supplier side. So the technology that you know has, has been around for a while may be out of date to be able to enable and improve the collaboration that is increasingly becoming an important fact to success in business to business technology as well as technology overall. Now, what we've seen though then as a result of you know what I just talked about with the millennials, what I just talked about also with these traditional points point approach to solutions is that we have core challenges within the modern pillars of sourcing. So if we take a look at, again, what Andrew had brought up, one of the key areas we see is in spend analytics. We see because of the disjointed nature, there's been an increased reliance on IT and dated BI tools that aren't providing the ability for self-service analytics and the ability for the procurement organization to provide trend information to their business stakeholders. There's been an inability to create the right data segments and, be, and to, to segment data in the way that makes useful sense for procurement to then provide to finance or to supply to the supply chain or other business unit stakeholders. And then again, as I said, there's this lack of self-service insight and understanding because you may have had some cumbersome spend analytic tool that no one knows how to use and you're not getting the optimal data. If you then continue that along the traditional process of, of going through sourcing, 
we see that e-sourcing itself, the RFX and auctions, may have been having reluctant user adoption because uh, you know people don't know how to use them and there's just been an ongoing reliance of manual tools, aka Excel spreadsheets. This, there's then a perception that because it's too difficult to use, we may not want to use a sourcing event for that. But then also there's a concern that maybe with my strategic suppliers, what if they don't participate in this RFP because they're thinking that we're going to replace them. So they may not be wanting to respond to the RFP or the auction simply because they may feel that enough information has already been provided to them, uh, to the buyer because they already know about this supplier, or simply because they're afraid of being replaced and there's not collaboration happening as a part of the strategic sourcing effort. Then if we take a look at supplier management, the classic dilemma here is having disparate systems. As I hinted at before, we often have vendor management systems that may uh, come from an ERP system, or you may have systems that aren't communicating, which then in, in, as a result creates a disharmony in collecting supplier information, which ends up becoming costs related to suppliers because suppliers may feel that they're being inundated with the same information requests over and over. This may also then prevent compliance, and this creates the document oversight that could cause you know, huge harm later on when working with that supplier. And then finally, the contract management aspect. Um, having the lack of contract management as a part of strategic sourcing creates potential savings leakage gaps where you may have identified 6% savings, but then you're not realizing that later on as a part of a procure-to-pay process. This also creates lack and wider capabilities around automation and also has costs related to contractual obligations because you don't have the insights to the relationships on your supplier and then managing against those contractual obligations that you've agreed to. So how do we then improve? How do we improve this process? Well, one of the things that we've seen is that we can try to connect the dots, as, as Andrew has, has, has mentioned, connecting the dots on spend analytics, e-sourcing, and supplier management and contract management as a part of the bigger picture. One way we can do that is by having sourcing applications that are much more supplier-centric, organizations that will adopt supplier lifecycle management as a broader umbrella uh, that processes and that encompass supplier information management, strategic sourcing, contract management, SPM, all the things that we are talking about that also add the aspect of risk, compliance, sustainability, diversity, and corporate social responsibility as a part of strategic sourcing. We also see that it's important to be collaborative. How, or again, as a part of the millennial framework, companies that will be looking for technologies that eliminate barriers for collaboration and do this by enhancing communication and providing organic support through process workflows with the focus on junctions where one process ends and another begins. This is through integration and the ability to connect supplier and sourcing solutions so that you can connect and suppliers and sourcing processes can take data from a variety of sources that update, refine, and enrich data and push it to other systems like ERP systems, like procure-to-pay systems and contract management. And then finally, connecting the dots is really related to the intelligence. And you know, now we've talked about big data often in this framework of IT. How do you turn massive quantities of raw, raw data into logical bytes of information and display them in the context that drives better decision making that will continue to be, you know, again, one of the biggest challenges for organizations. So as part of that, so what are the things that modern sourcing applications provide? You know, what we've personally experienced with our applications are things such as, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but even now I can use this new system because these modern sourcing applications are intuitive. Uh, another comment here, the first time I logged into a sourcing application, I figured out how to do almost everything by myself simply by playing with the tool. So these notions of making things easily usable, high user adoption is really based on the ability to make things simple, make things in a new framework, and provide this ability to increase collaboration. And finally, in terms of SIM, you know, one of our, our clients mentioned that the SIM built into the strategic sourcing tool promoted collaboration throughout the company as buyers are accessing and presenting well-informed buying strategies that help to create efficiency for meeting the company's goals. So finally, as we move on, what are some of the examples of where we see benefits? By having a common framework and connecting the dots, spend analysis then provide e-sourcing the ability to have flexibility in the uh, ability to see projects based on UNFPSC or custom taxonomies. And 
or creating flexibility to see projects based on supplier geographies and business units. What this does is improve category visibility so your strategic sourcing, uh, sourcing efforts are improved. By connecting supplier management to e-sourcing, you see the immediate conversions, for instance, of supplier profile that you went to go collect and, and demonstrate from, from a supplier profile directly into sourcing uh, and, and sourcing events. And what this does is improve, improve supplier onboarding compliance. And then finally, supplier management connected with contract management through things like integration of electronic signatures when you onboard suppliers for corporate information or improving compliance for supplier information to contract execution really helps the relationship between supplier management and contract management in ensuring that you're, you're keeping those relationships tight. Now what I'd like to do is now turn this over to Josh that will actually harp a little bit on the supplier management contract management example and it will show us you know, how do you, seeing the connecting the dots, how do you get this improvement and where does supplier management and contract management uh, come into play as a part of this bigger discussion? So Josh, I'm going to turn that over to you. All right, thank you. Hello everyone, this is Josh. Uh, I'm with Selectica and I think the reason I'm here today with you uh, is because in my role each day, uh, I'm giving product demonstrations and having conversations with clients and, and prospective clients. And in these conversations, I am, um, you know, not only giving demonstrations that are product-led, you know, what they're asking me to show them. I'm also having conversations about their pain points, uh, their business needs. Um, I'm responding to the questions they're asking within their RFPs. Um, I'm interacting with their IT departments and talking about data security and those kinds of things. And so, and in those conversations, uh, I think that's why I've been asked to come and, and relay some of what I'm hearing uh, in the trenches, if you will, uh, and really bring to light some of the things that Constantine and Andrew were talking about. With this first slide, uh, I think you, you saw a really big theme in the last couple of slides that Constantine went through, uh, supplier information management. And what I'm seeing the most uh, in my day-to-day -day demonstrations and conversations is the, the need to marry supplier information management data to contract data. And so for, for me, what I see is, is not a marriage of convenience, but really of risk avoidance and compliance, two very common themes that you've heard already and that I'll continue to talk about in our next few slides. Uh, but first, let me talk about the convenience part of this. What I'm not hearing is you know, people who just want a full source-to-pay solution, all the modules you can imagine, and, and great supplier information management and contracts just happen to be in there. So maybe we'll use them, maybe we won't. Of course, that's going to lead to poor adoption, no strategic initiatives. That's not going to work with the requirements of supplier information management to be collaborative and driving throughout the organization. The other thing I'm not seeing on the other end of the spectrum is uh, people who just want a e-sourcing demo or they just want to see a supplier portal or, or even more surprisingly, they just want to see contracts. And I think you know that wasn't the case maybe even a year ago, but most of the time when people want to see a contract management system, they almost always want to see all right, now show me how your supplier information management data works with this system and how uh, I manage the vendor database. Um, that's, that's really what I'm seeing now is not single module solutions, but multi-module solutions that people are interested in. And so why is that? I think managing risk and compliance is a top priority. So uh, really the risk comes in contracting and purchasing with vendors who don't comply with regulations and requirements. And I'm going to talk about a bunch of those, those regulations as we move through these slides. Um, and with that, there's a demand for an integrated solution that provides visibility into the previously unseen. Uh, really, visibility is very important here because what good you know, is a, a piece of data or a form uh, if you can't find that data or people can't collaborate and discuss that data. And then these last two bullets are really intertwined. Companies want to utilize the contract's tool to enforce these policies and all contractual relationships with suppliers. And a big part of that is this proactivity and innovation that was mentioned earlier by Andrew. So, the innovation to create a program. Oftentimes I don't hear about functionality. You know, I'm not demoing the buttons. Nobody wants to see that. They want to hear about our program and what we're going to bring to them to enable supplier management and relationship management. And the tool part of that and that third bullet is all about improving their internal performance and you know, I added this part about efficiency. Uh, we'll talk a little later about how to avoid mountains of, of paperwork and, and, and bottlenecks and things of that nature. All right, so the first area, focusing kind of exclusively on, on supplier data management as a start. So really where I'm seeing this a lot as a burning issue is, is manufacturers, food services, retail, uh, you know, 
types of, of verticals that are closely intertwined but also can have completely separate requirements. And uh, with that, a lot of the regulations and requirements I'm seeing uh, include things like conflict minerals. So, you know, those include uh, materials such as tantalum, tungsten, tin, gold from ore, things of that nature. So they need to know uh, is this coming into our manufacturing materials uh, or, or a product purchased for our direct materials. Uh, it's very important that they, they know among their supply base who is in compliance with conflict mineral regulations. Another one of those, Global Food Safety Initiative, or, or GFSI. Uh, these are initiatives driven to improve food, sa food safety uh, in the supply chain across all areas of manufacturing, retail, and food services. And then uh, Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, so do your vendors comply with minimum wage requirements or labor age requirements? And that even extends to the contract side. So with your employment agreements, are you in compliance with those regulations? And then in terms of trade regulations, it uh, really comes into play when doing business with global companies uh, and exports. Uh, and then finally, diversity. So many different companies have diversity requirements where they need to know, um, you know, how many diverse vendors they have, how many diverse sourcing awards have been given, how many of those companies are they uh, contracting with. So uh, in the picture here, you see examples of different forms that might be used in a, in a, a source to pay solution for gathering this data. And that's, you know, free text data is great, but a lot of this data can be gathered in, in standardized formats, drop downs, multi selects, and, and certainly attachments for gathering these types of documentations and certifications um, that, that we've talked about. So that could be a conflict mineral certification, it could be a diversity certification that proves what these vendors are, are uh, saying they are uh, instead of just typing in that they're, you know, a diverse vendor or something along those lines. All right. So next up, with that, like I mentioned earlier, one of the main points is visualization. So collecting those forms and that data is great, and maybe I even have a querying tool to maybe allow me to search for a type of vendor, but more and more what companies want is that data intrinsically tied to visualization, not only for individual users, but democratized across the organization. So uh, those who source need to know who to invite to sourcing events based on this information. Those who contract need to know when red flags should be raised based on the type of vendor that's being asked to contract with. Uh, those who deal in supplier performance management can associate the performance of suppliers with compliance to create a holistic picture of risk. And they're using visualizations such as this, uh, you know, red, green, amber reports or spend by minority reports and other things that you see here that are fully connected to these other areas of the organization that I mentioned. All right, and then moving that straight into contracts, there's some good tie-ins here, especially, you know, I mentioned conflict minerals with things like Dodd-Frank. So uh, in talking to, to companies in banking and financial services, what they're facing is the need to move from a pure cost focus to a risk focus. Um, and a lot of that is, is due to Dodd-Frank. And, you know, what that causes, you know, as a cascading effect is really the placing the importance on data security and compliance and, and combining that with a tool that brings them value. So. I think a great example of this is really us uh, in terms of being a supplier to companies in the financial services industry. Uh, there's an increase in scrutiny among vendors like us in software uh, that we must go through to contract due to the Dodd-Frank regulations. And that's because there are tighter restrictions on what financial services institutions must do to validate uh, data security, validate financials, governance, uh, and things of that nature. So what financial services companies have had to do is increase staff expand reporting requirements, expand auditing, and find tools for analysis and tracking. So I think, let's say before a contract with someone like us is finished, you know, after the sourcing is completed, the requisition and the assembly of the contract is completed, a team needs to verify supplier compliance to their Dodd-Frank requirements. And what's an easy way to do that? Have an integrated supplier information dashboard with these contract users so they know before they sign off on an approval that we are contracting with a vendor who is in compliance with these Dodd-Frank regulations. And so going further down the line, tying these two things together in, in a couple more examples before I turn this over to questions. Um, an area, another uh, a common discussion for us is legal firms and talking to especially companies who are working with legal firms. And this applies across all verticals for people who are, who are hiring and looking to hire legal firms. And as a as they look to evaluate which firms represent them, they're starting to include in their evaluation sections on supplier management programs and how they're being managed with these legal firms. 
So it's really, it's not the law firms that want to get involved in these supplier management activities. It's their clients that are demanding that they do. And so you can see in a lot of these icons on the screen some of the main areas of concern uh, among these different regulations. Um, conflict of interest or identifying any client conflicts where one part of the client or the practice is working with a client who uh, in the, with the opposing companies in a different lawsuit for a different practice uh, and those kinds of things. So uh, again, with the Fair Labor Standards Act, ensuring that legal firm suppliers are treated fairly in terms of hours and pay and benefits. Uh, things like Human Rights Watch to ensure that no supplier operates in a country that is in question for human rights violations. Sarbanes-Oxley, processes for law firms to report client fraud situations. Um, and I can go on and on. It includes things like terrorist watch lists or green initiatives. Really, they need to vet these law firms and gather data from them so that when they contract with them, they can be in compliance with these different regula regulations they're being asked to, uh, to review. And then finally, earlier I talked a, a bit about um, uh, efficiency and mountains of data. And I think a really good example of that is a couple different people I've talked to recently have been in the healthcare industry, and, and some interesting things I've seen is that they must collect different types of accreditations and other documentation from physicians and other professionals. And this really creates a mountain of paperwork across the country because you, you have different accreditations for different states and different types of professionals. And so these people are responsible for gathering this information, and a lot of them today are doing it in Excel files or even worse over email, and then maybe trying to house these things in SharePoint. So really, how is that going to be routed for approval, or how is someone going to find, is this physician up to date on their accreditation in Texas, for instance? So um, really, what they're looking for, and especially on the contracting side, is a way to gather this supplier accreditation data and other onboarding materials so when they go to contract with one of these vendors, they can click a button, pull up their compliance with these accreditations, and if everything's not in order, they can route that through an approval uh, and a, a data gathering system to make sure the physician, in this case, provides the information that is necessary for the contract to sign off. So really, that speaks to just the tool everyone, I think, should be looking for, uh, that it has the ability to gather that data, route it for approvals, and flow that information really uh, seamlessly into a contract solution. So thank you again for listening. That's all I have. I want to take the last couple minutes here we have for any questions, and I'll turn it over That's to you. Thank you so much, uh, Josh, for that insight, you know, kind of into the, the immediate thing that we see on a day-to-day -day basis and as it relates specifically to the research. We do have several questions here and have a few minutes, so uh, we'd like to get to address a few of these questions before we finish. And one of the questions that came across here um, was one question related to savings. It said, what in your experience are the estimated savings by implementing contract management besides uh, compliance? So maybe, Andrew, if you want to take a stab at that, maybe we could take a stab at that one over here as well. Sure, sure. So, so one of the, so um, I don't know that I've got that exact data point right in front of me, but one of the things I do know off, off the top of my head and, and, and was highlighted in last year's study, and, and, and so the numbers generally, you know, would trend this way, but uh, what we see is that with organizations that are able to close the loop with their uh, sourcing and contracting process and leveraging contract automation tools, they see a, a greater capture of their identified savings. And so it's somewhere on the lines of about 40%, uh, they, they retain 40% more of their savings, or maybe the, the reverse way of saying that is that their savings le leakage is 40% lower, right? So there, there's a, you know, if you consider all the work that's done to identify the opportunity and go through the sourcing process, when you're linking that process to automated contract management tools, you're saving a significantly higher percentage on a per project basis than, than you would otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to quickly answer that, you know, from our perspective, you know, the answer is quickly, I guess it really depends, but where we see the most efficiencies are in areas like auto renewals, in areas like evergreen contracts, and even in areas that people typically may not use as a bottom line measure like efficiency, uh, where you can actually increase the turn, you know, the workflow rate and the ability to say search on, pro on on contracts that you know were not able to be discoverable before simply because they were on paper-based systems. So there's a, quite a few of those. It's kind of a loaded question, but we definitely see improvements, and you know they align with uh, with some of the numbers that Andrew gave. But again, it really depends upon how vigorous uh, an adoption you take on, and you know a lot of the functionality that you are willing to do, whether it's from repository all the way to workflow and, you know, electronic signatures. I do have uh, another question here I'd like to ask. Uh, it says basically here, 
how are companies that talk to you managing multiple vendor databases, do these types of tools just add more databases and complexity? So, you know, I guess I'll throw this over to you, Josh. What do you typically see when you're dealing with multiple suppliers, and how do you kind of address that? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. It comes up all, really in every conversation we're having because we are talking about different areas of functionality that need to join together. So, um, you know, we have clients that are managing sourcing databases and now other teams that are managing supplier information databases, and we're talking about joining in with ERPs and other types of things. I think an important thing to keep in mind is the supplier life cycle and, and being mindful of, of where they are in that life cycle. So you might be uh, discussing onboarding with prospective vendors who want to do business with you. Um, you might be putting an event out to source with um, you know, different types of vendors that you've discovered through the solution or something along those lines. Those types of vendors shouldn't be pushed into the vendor database uh, or into the vendor master, excuse me. Um, and really, the main area of integration comes on the contract side. So once they're a contracted vendor and available for purchase, uh, you know, your team to purchase against that contract, then of course, a key thing is to get that vendor into the vendor master. So I think the main thing to always ask uh, someone you're talking to is, is what is your system of kind of pushing that data and, when, and how do you keep these, these areas clean? Um, I think, you know, it, full integration isn't required. They just need to have a good way to push data at the appropriate time. Okay. And then I'm going to take one last question here since we're kind of running out of time and went over our allocated uh, 60 minutes, uh, which is, is there a magical elixir or one thing that suppliers could do or say to stand out that addresses the concerns mentioned throughout the presentation? What would that one thing be in your opinion? So from a supplier perspective, what could that one thing be for them to help, you know, uh, stand out and address these concerns from a supplier side? Andrew? Well, I mean, I th you know, I think it's a competitive marketplace, right? So I think that, you know, being open to, um, you know, working with suppliers and collaborating, uh, and co collaborating with your customers on their platforms, I think, becomes a value add, right? I mean, if you're looking for ways to differentiate your products and services, right, I mean, you obviously have, you know, whatever it is that, that, that suppliers do, do, but, you know, being a, a, a supplier that's easy to work with, that's engaged, um, and that can be a low-cost supplier to manage, I think, is you know, a strong asset. I think that we're starting to see more RFPs, including those types of, of requirements you know, at the front end, so they're not you know, being sprung on suppliers at the back end. But there's a lot of value for, from the supplier side to being able to communicate and transact electronically. Yep, yep. And I, I, would, I, I would ditto the fact that even from a supplier standpoint, one of the things that we would encourage is that you know, they adopt uh, – uh, platforms and abilities to be more collaborative with the buying organization uh, so that they encourage uh, companies that they work with to be able to promote these tools so that they can uh, get their voice in, be able to e you know, even out the playing field and provide you know, a mechanism so that it helps the buying organization make a more uh, a determination based on more holistic approach rather than, again, as the cost factors that we talked about uh, a generation ago. So, so with that, I think what we'd like to do is to do a conclusion. Uh, I'd first of all I'd like to thank, uh, again, Andrew for, for joining us, uh, you know, and having his expertise on the phone. I will tell you that uh, you will be getting a, a, a copy for attending us. You'll be getting a copy of the, the re research that will be available later on this year by attending this webinar. Uh, these reports are, are, are certainly a wealth of information. And uh, we will be providing that for you, uh, as, as we had mentioned earlier. I'd also like to then point to uh, Andrew's information here. If you'd like to jot this down, we will be sending out or having these slides available online. Uh, so if you don't have a pen and paper handy, you can take a look. But this is Andrew's contact information. If you'd like to follow up with him specifically uh, around Arden Partners and what he does on, on the blog, CPO Rising. And then with that, I'd like to finally conclude and, again, appreciate your participation here. Josh, thank you for joining us here in the Indy office. Andrew, thank you for participating in Boston. And, again, as a conclusion here, you know, as an organization, we provide vision, insight, and control. Thank you for joining us, like I said, and look forward to having you join us on future events. Thank you.